Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Moore-Rame. Thank you so much for tuning in to So Booking Cool. My book, Something to Say, comes out July 14th. I hope you'll check it out. Take care, everyone. So fucking. So fucking. So fucking cool. There's so much fucking cool. So listen to So Booking Cool. Welcome to So Booking Cool. It's Jewel B. Today's guest is a critically acclaimed best-selling author. Her middle grade debut, A Good Kind of Trouble, a Walter Dean Myers honor book, is also now an indie bestseller in paperback. The book's protagonist, Shay, has been praised by many, including number one New York Times bestselling author, Angie Thomas, who says, Shayla's experiences, pitfalls, and triumphs will inspire young people for years to come. It is a well-written page turner with a voice that stays with you long after you put the book down. She also said the book is this generation's Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, you know, by Mildred D. Taylor. And author of Tyler Johnson Was Here, Jay Coles says, Shay is the type of heroine who inspires us all to take a stand. And from Newbery Medal Award winner, Erin Inchrada, Shay's voice is so genuine, she practically walks off the page. This is an important book and an incredible debut. And now we meet Janae, the protagonist of our guest's new sophomore title, Something to Say, a kid's next indie pick. The middle grade novel has starred reviews from Kirkus, Booklist, and School Library Journal, who says that this is a first purchase for middle grade collections. And author Renee Watson says, Something to Say is an ode to family and friendship a call to action, all housed in a story about a girl who finds the courage to face her fears and use her voice to speak up about the people and places that matter to her most. With tenderness, wit, and charm, Ramey creates unforgettable characters that readers will no doubt relate to and root for. Back with us again, she is author Lisa Moore Ramey. Stay tuned for our conversation right here only on So Booking Cool. So, hi. <laughs> hi. How, how are so you doing? I'm happy to be here. Likewise. Thank you, you know, for taking the time. Exciting to have you back. I remember when we, you know, talked a bit about something to say last year, you know, and now... The book is getting ready to be released into the world. I have to say, how how do you feel about a good kind of trouble having this resurgence? Um, I am, you know, I have to say first that I'm I'm really grateful. Um, it was very unexpected when I knew that the book was going to be released in paperback some time ago. I thought, you know, it'll be it'll be quiet. I had kind of forgotten what day even it was going to be released. Um, and so I was, I was surprised that it actually um, had a very strong release. But of course, the reason for that is connected to what was going on in the world at the time, what's still going on. Um, the George Floyd killing has happened not, you know, it's not too distant in the past. And because of that, there was a call for amplifying Black voices. Um, it was really clear that we needed to do things different in society. And so a lot of books were getting um, renewed attention or extra attention. And there was also a call for a very specific type of book, books that were explaining Black Lives Matter or were explaining what police brutality looked like from a Black perspective. And those are issues that are addressed in a good kind of trouble. I think probably too, because it's a book written for young people, a lot of adults were finding it accessible. So things were being explained to them in a way that they didn't have to work too hard to understand. And so I was really, I was torn because of course, everyone likes to see strong book sales, but it's it's sad when those book sales are connected to a tragedy. 
Well said, if I must say so myself. And you know, in light of everything that has been going on with the social unrest, you know, the, the killing of George Floyd, as well as the pandemic, how have you been doing during these times? Um, I've been doing okay, all things considered. I, I think strictly from the pandemic side of things, um, I've been really busy. Um, I have a full-time job that keeps me very, very busy. I changed units at the university that I work for kind of right before shelter in place started. It, um, I moved in February, moved jobs. And so when I started working from home, I was swamped trying to figure out this new gig and working constantly. And that was quite frankly a blessing because I didn't have time to watch the news to worry really about what was going on and my job has settled down somewhat so now unfortunately I do have a lot more time to focus on things and and see just how dismal the news is every day um, I try not to watch too much of it and when the focus changed this shift went from being primarily worried about the virus to suddenly police brutality being back in the news um that that's that was really hard you know that it's difficult to work in a space that is a primarily white space um, where you're in zoom meetings all day and it can sometimes feel like you're a bit on display if you're one of a handful of black um, staff members. So that part's been that part's been hard, but um, I I feel really fortunate that I have a job um, that you know I'm still collecting my paycheck, and that I also have you know this other wonderful job of writing. And speaking of writing, how has it been to connect with readers and your audience virtually? Um, that's been interesting. In, in some ways, it's been um, not an improvement, I would say, but there's been more opportunities to do it. You know, because of my job, I can't always go out to schools for school visits. And of course, I found myself just like every other author out there having lots of things canceled um, when this all started. A lot of school visits that were happening, a lot of conferences that were happening, you know, all got canceled. And that was that was tough. I had a lot of things I was looking forward to, but then some some new opportunities came up. You know, a lot of conferences were trying a virtual format, and I participated in some of those. I have um, a few coming up in the summer that I'll be doing, and I know they're they're the type of things that I maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if I had to actually travel to those places. And then just from a fan, from a personal standpoint, it's been kind of cool for me to be able to go to conferences that I wouldn't have been able to travel to, not as a panelist, but just as an attendance member, an audience member. So that's been good. But I've heard from a lot more people, and I don't know if it's because of paperback releasing of a good kind of trouble or if it's just the time, but I've gotten many more letters in the past couple of months of people reaching out, wanting to just let me know that they were grateful uh, to have read the book and have an understanding of some of the issues in a way that they hadn't before. So that's been really wonderful to hear from readers. And you know, something that you're writing readers and people in the industry that you have been praised for is the voice that you give to your characters. Is that something that is important to you and what is your approach? Uh, it is something that is really important to me as someone who struggled for quite some time to nail voice down when I was getting rejections when I was in the query trenches for years and years and getting rejections from agents. One of the things that I heard was that they weren't connecting to the voice. Um, now, 
for those of us in the black community, sometimes we roll our eyes at that because sometimes that just means they're not looking for a black girl. And my characters are black girls usually. And so there's some of that, but I also had to be really honest with my writing and take a second look at it and, and recognize that I had a bit of a academic tone to my young person's voice. I have a master's in English literature and when I first started writing I wrote like someone who had a master's in English lit versus a kid lit author and I did a lot of homework, meaning I read a ton of middle grade novels, trying to see what was the difference between what I was putting on the page and what some of these authors were doing. And I also started really listening to the young people around me and trying to get a sense more of what they really sounded like, not a literal translation of what they sounded like, but really more just kind of a, a vibe of the way that they talked and how their sentences were shorter. And I really enjoy getting into the head of my character as much as possible. And so when I'm putting their words on the page, I'm really trying to put down exactly what I feel they would truly say instead of kind of giving them a script to read. Okay, what do you mean by that instead of giving them a script to read? So, you know, oftentimes we we know what we want a character to say and, and by that I mean we know what we need them to say in order to move the story in a certain direction. And sometimes we can put words in their mouth that are, have the right intent but if we were being true to that character, we would know they would never say it exactly that way. And one of the things that I do often is I will read sections aloud because that's the way that I can tell whether or not it's in the person's voice or not. And I kind of, you know, act it out and see, does this sound normal? Does this sound the way that Shayla or Janae, would they, would they really say it this way? And usually my first try is wrong. It's like, no, they wouldn't say it exactly this way. It would be a slightly different word choice. Um, and so that's something I do with, with all of the characters to try to make sure I'm connecting with them and letting, and being honest, um, letting them be honest with the way they want to express themselves. I think that if you, as an author, if you've done a good job of character development, then that character should be able to talk to you pretty clearly and express themselves in a way that you should can almost just you know let them dictate to you what they need to say and get it down and how do you test if the if the dialogue from a young character like the middle grade age characters that you write about how do you test that that seems accurate that they would say that you know, it's it's definitely tricky because I am not a middle grade student. I have not been that age in quite some time and I recognize that and you know it's interesting you know because you can go out and you can listen to young people talk and I think it's it's a way to get a good sense of kind of rhythm you know and hear the way that they express themselves. And you can't be creepy about it. You know, I don't mean like creeping around schools and, and eavesdropping that way, but you know, you can, you can be out around in town, maybe not during a pandemic, but in normal times and hear what the way that young people talk or how anyone talks. And you never wanna write down verbatim what someone would, would say, because that's not actually, we don't write that way. We don't, write down the way we speak in real life, but you do hear a certain, cadence isn't the right word, but a certain way of delivery, you know, a certain, like for my characters, there is such a fervent belief in, in what they're saying to be, to be true, and they're kind of filled with their own self-importance sometimes, and I think that's, 
just kind of true of, of young people, of wanting to be understood. And so, you know, it, it will hit my ear completely wrong. Like if it's just not right, like I'll say it out loud and it's like, oh, that doesn't, that just does not sound the way a kid would talk. Um, you know, I can imagine, you know, I can put in my head like the image of a young person. And if I'm seeing them, it, it makes it even easier to like imagine like the words coming out of that person's face <laughs> and know like, okay, they wouldn't sound, they wouldn't sound like, you know, a 50 year old woman. They just wouldn't. So um, it's doing a little bit of homework to kind of fine tune your ear. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So speaking of these young characters, what is the heart and soul of Janae? What is the heart and soul of Something to Say? I think the heart and soul of Something to Say would be kind of finding your, finding your voice. But the heart and soul of, of Janae is something that, that I just really love about her. Janae is an oddball and she is a self-described oddball. She tells us early on in the story that she's odd and that there's nothing wrong with that. And I had such delight in creating a character like that, particularly because I feel we don't see that enough in stories. We often see a character that doesn't fit in who has a big problem with not fitting in and is trying to figure out how they can be more popular, how they can have more friends, or how they can do the things, kind of put the mask on to look like everyone else. And instead we have Janae who says, that's not the game I wanna play. I wanna be who I am and I'm perfectly fine with that. The only person who's maybe not fine with it is my mother. And she also, she doesn't have any friends and she's fine with that too. She thinks that's kind of a lot of work and she doesn't want to have to change who she is just in order to have friends. So I wanted to send kind of a love letter to the oddballs out there who might be similar to Janae, who want people to know just because I'm different does not mean there's something wrong with me. And that to me is more the heart of the story than anything else is that, you know, Different doesn't, be, doesn't mean wrong, and it's great if you can find a way to accept yourself the way that you are. You will have a much happier life if you can get there, and if you can get there as soon as Janae got there, you know, power to you. Now, what is it that makes Janae think that friendships take a lot of work? She sees the kind of negotiations that go on on the the um, school playground and kind of the, you know, the hurt feelings and the gossiping and, you know, who's popular and who's not. Uh, I relay something that happened to her when she was in elementary school where you know, girls got invited to a party and not everyone got invited. And she was one of the people who wasn't invited. And she didn't care because she didn't want to go to that party. It was a horse riding party. Party. She didn't want to ride a horse. But the girl, other girls who did get invited were very upset and wanted her to be upset. And because she wasn't upset, she wasn't friends with the girls who got to go to the party and she wasn't friends with the girls who didn't go to the party. And she felt very much like, well, okay, you know, I shouldn't have to change the way I feel about something in order to have friends. And that's what she sees um, kind of friendship as being. And it's not until Aubrey, a new kid comes to school and actually has no interest in her being anything different than the way she is, he's into a lot of the same things that she is, that she is finally able to see that, oh, you know, it's not that friendship is a problem. It's more that being fake in order to have a friend. That's where the problem comes from. Wow. Okay. So when you were 
when you were around 11 years old, can, can you see any of yourself in, in Janae or as well as your daughter? Um, I definitely was an oddball. Um, I, you know, it's funny because there's things that we can be into that we just, you know, there's no explanation. You don't know why they come to be. I know that when, when I was a kid, probably about the same age that we find Janae, um, I was really into music from the 50s, which was something that nobody that I knew was into. And my parents weren't playing that music for me, but I would listen to it every night. And I was really, really into black and white movies. I loved movies from the 30s and 40s. I have no idea why, um, you know, <laughs> and I didn't really, I didn't care, you know, I think partly because I was such a huge reader. I loved books and I would say that books were my, my first friends. I did have friends. I wasn't like Janae in, in not having friends, but my books were more important to me than my friends. So, you know, I could just stay in my room and read all day and be perfectly happy. And so I, I definitely find that part of myself in Janae. Um, I think Janae is a little bit, a little bit more tougher than, than I was. Um, the other thing though that we definitely share was a fear of public speaking. And I, I feel kind of bad that I did this to Janae, but I had such a horrible fear of public speaking until I was an adult, really. And I took one of my classroom experiences that happened in college and gave her that horrible, horrible experience. Um, and, you know, so there's been people who have read that scene and they're like, you know, how could it be that bad to be that afraid of talking in, in public? And I'm like, well, I, I know for sure it can be that bad because that's what happened to me. And being confronted with it in your class, is that what helped you to get over it, would you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I wouldn't have known it at the time. And, I, and because it was such a strange way to get over something, I actually did not write it this way in the book. Um, when, when Janae has to talk in class, it does not help her get over her fear at all. But in my case, um, when I had to finally give a speech my second year in college, I was so, you know, probably like the closest, closest I've ever felt to dying, I think. I mean, I, I almost fainted. I was going to pass out. It was, it was horrific. I was sweating like you wouldn't believe like it was just so horrible to stand up there with my little note cards shaking sweating knowing that everyone was looking at me judging me thinking I was a mess feeling sorry for me and then it was over and I sat back down and I kind of looked around the class and that's when I realized that nobody cared at all. Like half the class had not even been paying attention. And it was such an eye opener to me because I, I recognized A, that my fear came mainly from that, that sense of being judged and hating that. But the B part was that I wasn't being judged because nobody cared. You know, it was for them, it was just another boring assignment. They didn't care what I had to say. I couldn't tell you what my speech was about. Um, and after that, it got a lot easier to stand up in front of people because I recognized that, you know, I was putting a whole lot of emphasis on what they were thinking about me versus just focusing on what it is that I needed to say. So it, going through that horrible experience actually really helped me get over my fear of public speaking. Something to say also has themes about people being held accountable for past remarks. Can you tell us more about that? 
Yes, I was really interested in exploring that. I mean, there's, you know, I kind of find little tidbits of things as I go through life that I find interesting and I kind of put them away somewhere. And then when I'm working on a book, all of these little tidbits will come up and some of them will be like, oh, this is the right tidbit for this, this book. And one of, one of the things that has interested me because it happened a couple of times in my community was this idea of school name changes. And a lot of times the reason why a community looks at naming, uh, changing the name of a school is because someone in the community maybe has risen to prominence or the um, demographic has changed, but sometimes it's because the school was named after someone who is now a problematic figure, um, which is what happens in, in Something to Say. Um, and and I, I just find that interesting because I find it fascinating how many people are on the other side of that, the people who fight to keep the name the same. You know, we see it a lot in sports teams where fans of a team really want to hold on to a name even though it's problematic. They really want to continue to be the Redskins. That's one that, like, I still just can't ever quite understand. Like, I don't understand why someone would say our ability to keep the name outweighs the fact that this is hurtful to a segment in our society. And I think with problematic figures, when we kind of enlarge in the, the argument, you start thinking about like, well, there are people in history who have done things and, you know, do we still hold them to high regard when we find out that they've done things that, that we as a society say are, are bad? say are, are negative. And in, when I was working on this book, um, it was, the question was coming up a lot, not about historical figures like we're seeing now, but more about um, celebrities. And there were, you know, what came out of the Me Too movement, you know, there were celebrities being called out. And there's always this question of, do you, can you separate the artist from the art? And, you know, I, I struggle, I, I struggle with the people who say, yes, you can. You can still support someone, even if they've done horrible things. It was really hard for me when um, we learned about Bill Cosby's acts because, you know, I had been a big fan of his. I grew up with his comedy and I loved the Cosby show. I think that it, it, it was such a positive um, force for the black community. And so that was heartbreaking, but how can I, as, you know, a right-minded person stand and say, you know, it, well, it doesn't matter that this, this person abused all of these women, I, I'm still going to support his, his acting. Like, that just doesn't make sense to me. So um, I definitely had a, a viewpoint in writing the story, you know, when we're looking at John Wayne and the fact that, you know, he said, you know, horrible things, racist things about black people, about native people, that he was kind of proudly a white supremacist. So, um, I definitely had a viewpoint of what I thought about him and his acts, but I also wanted to present it in a way, in a story of saying, okay, let's not, let's not prejudge. Let's actually explore this question of should, should things that he said in the past be still held up as something that we have to hold against him? And, you know, I would argue yes, but I wanted to explore both sides of the question so that someone reading the book would feel that it, the issue had been looked at fairly. Are you hoping that this book, Something to Say, will spark conversations about when you should decide to forgive somebody in this context? I think so. You know, I think that it's, it's definitely a hard question. You know, this whole idea of forgiveness 
can be really tricky and and particularly if you are not the wronged party you know i think that it's really the wronged party who is who has the opportunity to forgive or not and it can be very difficult if you are not in the equation you know to maybe stay quiet but i think that probably that that that's your role but if it's if if you weren't being heard i don't think you're the person who can say oh we should forgive this person i do think that if in the case of someone who's still alive who still has the opportunity to say yes i said this horrible thing and we we've been seeing this a lot with people being exposed for you know racist tweets that they made in the past um for someone to come out and say yes i did this and yes it was wrong and i don't feel this way anymore and not only that i am going to take steps to to live my life and to show that like this is not the way that i that i believe i believe i'm going to build other people up i truly am going to be anti-racist not just um kind of sit quietly and that to me is is powerful you know and i want to hear from those people you know and and allow them the room for that i don't think that we do you know society any service if we say we don't ever want to forgive someone um depending on what it is they did let me be clear about that like i mean i think that there are some acts that are so egregious you know that you know i'm not talking about um if you're being raped if you have been raped to forgive the rapist no i'm talking about specifically someone saying something inappropriate um who has truly changed and and now wants to be forgiven i still think you hold them accountable though and i think if if that person is someone who has monuments built up to them i think those monuments should come down i think forgiveness doesn't mean well we still get to hold you up and honor you i think you no longer get to be held up and honored but you can be forgiven you can be forgiven you know something that we talked about also the first time that we that we chatted last year was you and your agent and we talked about the publisher and the editor alessandra as well it falls in bray so what i would like to know is do you feel like working together a second time has the relationship strengthened were there any changes like how has that experience been collaborating again um i definitely it has strengthened you know it's so the, the journey of an author is is really interesting you know you especially if you are like me and it's something that you wanted for so long and i think with the first book with a good kind of trouble i was so grateful that the book had been sold that i think alessandra could have asked me to do anything <laughs> i would have made that change um now she did not ask me to make any ridiculous changes or edits but you know it it and i don't i i don't think everyone's like this i think particularly um authors who have had a shorter journey um, because their expectation was that this was going to happen for them so i think they might be a little bit quicker to ask for things that they feel that they deserve and and for me i was just i was just happy to be in the room you know <laughs> just happy that someone had invited me to the party and i still am am so happy that someone invited me to the party but i also recognize that I do have a voice and what has always been true what's really lovely about both Brenda and Alessandra is that I would say that they both recognized that and were interested in hearing my voice well before I felt strong enough to voice it um but I feel with as as Alessandra and I continue working together that we moved from a being almost like boss employee to partners and you know she and i think both recognize that we work together 
on the books and it's important for both of us to get it right. And I think, you know, with, with Brenda, we, we don't do as much um, editorial work together. It's, it's much more focused on, you know, the business of, of selling books. But she and I too, you know, have just a very strong partnership relationship of, you know, she wants, she wants to know what I want to do professionally and how I want to expand my career. And that's something that I just really appreci appreciate about them both. I also have to say, just as an aside, that's um, something, I don't know how common this is, but something I noticed early on in working with Alessandra is that every single email that she sends to me, she always CCs Brenda. And I really like that because even if it has, you know, there's, there's not a particular reason, it does keep that, um, that whole feeling of, you know, the three of us are working together on this project. And I, I like the respect that they give each other, you know, as of course, to me as well. Oh, well, that's such a lovely thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it keeps everybody in the loop. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of, you know, the publishing industry, and we did touch on this earlier, what are your thoughts on publishing looking to amplify marginalized voices in the industry? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of amplifying marginalized voices. Um, you know, I think familiar with the graphics that show just how poorly we've been doing that um, for decades. You know, we just are not, we're not doing a good job. We haven't been amplifying voices. And I think that people, you know, kind of get lulled into a sense of like, well, you know, we must be doing well because look at Angie Thomas and Nick Stone and Jason Reynolds. It's like, there's these celebrities, but you think, yeah, that's three <laughs> that you can name. Um, in this world of publishing that's vast, and we shouldn't have to stop at three. And obviously, there's, there's plenty more of, of um, highly successful Black authors, but it's still a very small number. And a lot of us in the Black community of, of writers, you know, we all kind of know each other. And you think, well, that's, like, how could that even be? You know, but it's because there's so few of us. So I'm really delighted that publishing is saying that um, they would like for things to change, that they would like there to be better representation. I am, maybe I'm a pessimist, but I'm nervous that the, the loudness that we have heard that, that's already starting to quiet down is something that is very short-lived, that we had this burst of energy, this, you know, kind of week of Amplify Black Voices, this week of Black Out, the bestseller list. And, you know, we need more than a week. We need more than people giving lip service to this idea of, yes, it would be nice if we had more authors of color getting published. You know, that's something that, you know, quite frankly, publishers are gonna have to put their money where their mouth is. They're gonna have to make offers to authors of color. And not only are they gonna have to buy those books, but they're going to have to put steps into place to market those books so that they actually have a fair shot at getting sold. Know, making sure that they that people know that they're out there you know books come and go and you know just publishing a book isn't enough you know making sure that people can find it is is the real job and so i'll be watching and and hoping to, to see a real change and i'm hoping that my pessimism will be you know not not well founded and that I'll be proved wrong and that this will actually be a very long lasting movement um, and, and pushing forward change. 
wanting to see the industry become a lot more inclusive and everything, those are some expectations that I'm sure many, many people in publishing have and want to see be met. What can you say about expectations as an author? As an author, do you have any type of expectations at all when it comes to your books? Um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of expectations when it comes to my books as far as um as far as like sales numbers or um that i do have a, a certain level of expectation of how the book is handled you know it's, it's it's so odd because you know seeing this movement spring up at the same time that we're living in the midst of a pandemic it it changes everything um you know if 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 the pandemic wasn't going on then you know i would have certain expectations of saying you know it's time for publishers to make sure that they are looking to see within their author ranks you know who they can send to conferences that they haven't been sending and you know what you know putting black authors on panels that have nothing to do with race but have everything to do with craft you know like the, these are changes that we need to see in the industry that make it clear that this isn't about just producing books about quote unquote black issues like that these are these are books that just happen to be written by a black person and so we're going to treat them the same way we would treat a book written by a white person we're going to do the same type of marketing and I, so I have that expectation when it, now when it comes to, I don't know if I did when I first entered the industry, but I do now of when I get the same thing that you would give to anybody else. You know, I don't want there to be this separate kind of small alley that we get um, sent down if we're a writer of color that is, you know, saying like, well, that's good enough for your type of book um and i also i mean i think one of the expectations is to is also to expand the types of books we see by black authors and i think you know there's people out there who are already doing such incredible work like that like justina ireland and um l mckenna like where we are seeing you know fantasy books and 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 those are the types of stories that, in addition to the books that are looking at racism, that we need to see. And hopefully we'll see more of those um, come our way. I think that readers are ready for it. So hopefully publishers will start putting that out there. And when people read a book by you, what, what is the feeling that you want them to walk away from? Oh, you know, I... so. I, it's funny because I get a lot of um, email from adults who read my books. I think because there's a lot of uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of librarians who are checking out books to see if it would be something good for their classroom, and I love that. But you know, I'm I'm not writing really for them. I'm really writing for young people, and what I'm hoping that they take away from my books a big huge thing is that fear is normal and fear is not something to make you feel that there's something wrong with you or that you're less than just because you are afraid to do something because we all have it we all are afraid of something some of our fears can be you know can stop us in our tracks but hopefully the, the other message that from my books is that you may just find the courage to overcome a fear given the right set of circumstances, given something going on in the world around you that, that is going to push you into kind of embracing that fear and saying, okay, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do this anyway. And you know, I, I definitely want to see more young activists spring out of reading my books and feeling like, you know what, I can do this. I'm going to take this on. I'm afraid, but I'm going to try it anyway. And that's, 
something that I think you'll continue to see in all of my books. You're going to see a lot of characters who are afraid of something. And maybe that just goes to me and the fact that I'm afraid of a whole lot of stuff. So I feel it's very normal. And I like the idea that hopefully I can spread a little bit of courage out there. Wow. And on that note, Miss Lisa Moore Renee, <laughs> that was excellent. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you, Joel. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Thank you again for, for coming on. And it was wonderful to speak with you again. And you know, much continued success with you and you and, you, and your work. Do you have any upcoming projects? Um, I do. I am working on book three. So, you know, it's funny. Um, I should mention too that, you know, I had a goal. I told my agent when I first started working with her that I wanted to do a book every year. And I felt a little bit like I was failing if that didn't happen. So I was really pleased that something to say was coming out um, the year after a good kind of trouble. Well, my next book, which is a fantasy, um, does not come out the next year in 2021. It won't come out until 2022. And at first I thought, oh no, you know, I'm losing. I've, I've missed a step. But after now going through this experience of having a book come out well, at the same time of the paperback of, you know, the other book and, and it all getting kind of conjoined together. I'm looking forward to that, that year break. But the third book is, um, it's a male protagonist who is a map maker, which means that every time he sits down to create a map, he actually creates a world. Um, he brings a whole world into existence. And so I just love this character and this idea. I've, I've had this idea in my head for years of this young boy who could create worlds. And um, I've always loved maps. And so this was a way of combining that. And I'm, it just, it's a story that, that, you know, it's so hard for me to write because I really, really want to do it well. And it's been a struggle, but I'm very excited about it coming out in 2022. That is extremely exciting. And you are diversifying your, your talents and the voices. This is a fantasy with a male protagonist. I've, that is so exciting. Yeah. So how can people stay connected and stay updated with you and get, uh, and get something to say? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so um, today is available for pre-order now. It releases um, July 14th, which uh, I'm looking at a calendar right now. It's like, wow, it is almost, you know, it's less than two weeks from now. That blows my mind. Um, and you can find me on my website, which is lisamoreremay.com. Um, and most easily find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at Lee's Ray, which is L-E-E-S-E-R-A-Y. Yes, everybody make sure you check out Miss Lisa Moore May <laughs> and you know, stay tuned. I know I'm gonna be staying tuned. And thank you all to listening, you know, until next time, so booking cool. And Lisa, we have to talk again for those upcoming projects. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone.